All right, hi everybody, and welcome to today's Ivy Wave webinar, Private Networks for Utilities and Energy, Understanding a Key Vertical for Private LTE and 5G. My name is Kelly, I work at Ivy Wave in the marketing team, and I'm joined by our guest speaker today, Dean Bubbly from Disruptive Analysis. Um, so just um, to get started here, there's a few housekeeping items. One is that we are recording the webinar, so we will send everybody um, a copy of the video um, in the next day or so. Please ask us questions as you go using the GoToWebinar question box. You should all have access to. Um, and we don't have any polls here, so we can just ignore that. Uh, we can ignore that last point. Um, so to get started, I'm just gonna, I have a few slides and a few minutes on who Ivy Wave is for those who are joining who don't know us. And then I'm gonna leave the rest of the webinar to our expert here, Dean. Um, so who is Ivy Wave? We've been around for 17, 18 years in the in-building wireless space. Uh, we provide software to design, survey design, um, and manage both indoor and outdoor wireless networks, as well as wireline. Um, we're spread out pretty globally around the world with, um, you know, over 1,200 customers in over 100 countries. Um, we have a whole community of Ivy Wave certified professionals around the world um, and really the software used for in-building wireless for probably hundreds of thousands of wireless networks um, and counting. Um, so just to give you a, a high level idea of the software that we provide, we, we provide a survey and design solution for wireless networks. Because we're focused on private networks today, we have that here. So what it is, a solution where you can survey and design multiple technologies, so your Wi-Fi networks, CBRS, LTE, 4G, 5G, and IT, all from a single solution. Um, we have a mobile app that allows you to do the survey piece of cellular and Wi-Fi together, um, which you can utilize for private networks. And then our bread and butter is really our network design software, which is a 3D predictive modeling that has things like fast ray tracing um, and prediction calibration, really focused on the accuracy of designing your network. So whether it be a Wi-Fi network or CBRS 5G network, um, you can design that in 3D using our software. And then we also have an outdoor um, network design solution that integrates to our indoor for those challenging campus networks. So you can account for the indoor and the outdoor and vice versa. And then we have a cloud that sits above all of that so that you can maintain, um, you can basically digitize and maintain all of your site documentation and your projects and all of your sites um, in one single location for future reference and upgrades and maintenance purposes. So that's at a high level, uh, essentially what we offer at Ivy Wave. Um, we have several different products that you can do that with, depending on what your technology design needs are, right? So starting at the top there, we have our Ivy Wave design software in which you can design all of these different types of wireless networks, whether that's 3G, 4G, LTE, Wi-Fi, CBRS, IoT, public safety, all in a single solution. We have Ivy Wave Reach, which is the outdoor um, design, which integrates into that indoor design. And then we've started to offer solutions really focused on singular technologies. So we have a Wi-Fi only solution, and then we have a solution just for public safety. Um, moving away from just wireless, we also have a, a fiber um, solution design um, wireline. And then we have collaboration across the bottom. So we have um, our more advanced Ivy Wave Unity Cloud, which is you can manage and have visibility across all of your sites. Um, and then a, a free um, viewer for your customers that you can send them the designs for review. And then some, a basic cloud as well. So that was just to give you an overview of who Ivy Wave is and, and the different products that we offer. And at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Dean to take it over for the rest of the webinar. Dean, over to you. Thanks, Kelly, and thanks for the introduction. <clears throat> so I'm going to um, give a, an analyst perspective on private cellular networks in utilities and also the energy and oil and gas industries. Um, I've done a, a few of these webinars for IB Wave in the past, and it's interesting to look at different sectors in a bit more depth. There's some common themes around CBRS, private LTE and 5G, um, but the applications and use cases and the motivations and drivers are very different for, for each industry that I find. So um, 
Yeah, really, we're, we're sort of considering connectivity in a whole set of both traditional and new parts of um, the utility and wider energy sector. And I'll be talking about that as I go through both the, um, for example, the existing uh, grid and transmission networks, but also newer parts of the infrastructure that are getting built out, whether that's renewables and uh, power generation distributed um, uh, energy resources, and the, uh, um, uh, the you know, hydrocarbon sector, there's obviously exploration and production, uh, and even some uh, aspects of this which are now offshore connectivity as well as onshore. Um, and and you know, clearly there's an awful lot of both technology choices, but interestingly there's also now um, design and business model and ownership choices that are coming into um, not just uh, wireless and 4G and 5G, but other technologies as well. Um, and I'll touch on those uh, as I go through. As a quick introduction, um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm based in the UK. Um, I'm a telecoms and technology analyst and advisor. Um, you know, I, I cover quite a lot of different topics, but I spend most of my time looking at wireless networks and services. Um, I also do quite a lot of stuff on um, uh, voice and video communications, which actually is relevant uh, in some of the sectors I'm talking about here. Um, given the uh, requirements for critical communications between field workers and others. Uh, and I'm also a general futurist, so I spend a, a certain amount of my time looking out to 5, 10, even 20 year horizons on what's happening with everything from energy to population to geopolitics to AI and IoT and yeah, essentially a lot of the, the sort of fun bits of technology uh, and how they all intersect. Um, and there's obviously an awful lot of um, overlaps in um, the areas we're looking at now because of um, not just uh, industrial transformation, but energy transitions and decarbonization, um, as well as the role of um, AI and analytics and data and all the um, security and privacy implications that brings. Um, and I work uh, internationally. I'll be uh, focusing today mostly on um, uh, North America and Europe uh, and parts of developed Asia. Um, but I, uh, I, I cover a, a fairly broad global um, uh, picture of what's going on with technology and especially telecoms. Um, my, my alter ego is Disruptive Dean uh, on social media. I, I tend to sort of disagree with people as much as I agree with them. Um, and so I, I've got a fairly low tolerance of hype and hopefully um, people won't think that I'm uh, overstating the case uh, for private networks today. But if you are, or if you think I'm not significantly, or I'm not, I'm not uh, positive enough, uh, put a comment in the chat or any questions, and uh, we'll come on to those at the end. So I've, I've actually realised that um, I've spent 20 years it was the first time I looked at um, a small cell for a private, uh, actually at the time, private 2G network, um, and yeah, that's important because at one level. This is not new. Um, companies have been deploying their own um, cellular infrastructure, you know, in specialized locations, whether it's on oil rigs or whether it's in remote areas or military sites, um, you know, bits of other you know, public sector infrastructure for some considerable time. But what's happening at the moment is a inflection point. Um, we're seeing around the world, um, and particularly in North America and parts of Europe and, and also Japan, um, a sudden recognition that enterprises, both large enterprises and increasingly mid-sized enterprises and sections of government can build their own um, cellular infrastructure and, and run them, either in-house or with specialist uh, service providers and um, integrators. So it's no longer this sort of binary world um, where wireless networks are either you know, private and they're maybe Wi-Fi or fixed links, um, or they're public and they're coming from a carrier and they're mobile 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. There's now an awful lot of middle ground emerging. Uh, and I mean, uh, I often get asked about convergence and convergent technologies, um, and and yeah, some of the time there's a lot of hype about convergence as well. Um, to the extent that sometimes actually divergence is more interesting. But what is definitely happening at the moment is the phrase I would use is democratization and modernization. And there's, there's probably also elements of virtualization in some industries, although perhaps less in utilities. Um, on the cellular side, um, we are definitely seeing a massive shift from 
um, cellular networks being the domain of a few hundred or globally maybe a thousand network operators with license spectrum to thousands and then potentially in future tens of thousands um, of enterprises and other organizations running their own cellular networks. Um, you know, indeed, there's, there's some which are now trying to uh, assert that we may end up with millions of almost sort of Wi-Fi levels of adoption at, at small scale. And I certainly speak to you know, a lot of companies that are trying to make cellular infrastructure as easy to deploy as Wi-Fi. Now that tends to be in building rather than over wider areas, and that's a, a significantly greater challenge, and I'll talk about that. But either way, there is this ongoing trend that's supported by both technology and regulatory shifts, and to some extent economic ones. Um, towards the democratization of cellular networks. And at the same time, on the utility side and, and also in energy, there is a huge amount of industrial transformation, uh, modernization of uh, grids, uh, technologies, both transmission, distribution, metering, and so on. And that goes alongside the requirement for collecting and acting upon exponentially growing amounts of data. Um, you know, whether that is real-time uh, data around uh, consumption and demand or whether it's around um, you know, the uh, power being generated from distributed energy resources, whether it's data collected for the water industry around environmental monitoring, whether it's looking for um, uh, the impact of fires or other natural phenomena in the surrounding uh, environment. Either way, there is a huge amount of um, modernization, data orientation, and transformation that is going on. Um, and together they are yeah, leading us towards a path of critical communications, both for humans and for connected systems, um, over private as well as public mobile networks. It's worth stepping back a little bit and say, yeah, I, I realize there's, there's, there's a, a significant diversity of people in the call and if you like subsectors within the domain that uh, I'm talking about today. So within the within the electricity sector, obviously you have generation, whether that's classic uh, generation at um, you know gas and oil and nuclear and hydroelectric plants. There's the wide area transmission network, a little more localized and regional substations and distribution um, to um, to end customers, both consumers and businesses. We've also got the oil and gas industry, which has you know, upstream and downstream components, uh, as well as new areas such as uh, liquefied nat nat natural gas, which is being shipped around the world as a, a more um, fungible alternative to piped energy. Um, and then there's other bits of utilities, uh, such as uh, water treatment and reservoirs, uh, and obviously they come together in, in uh, hydropower as well. Um, Offshore, uh, we're seeing both, obviously we've had offshore oil and gas for many years, but uh, increasing emphasis in offshore wind. Um, and that brings additional problems when we think about connectivity for obvious reasons. Um, you know, there's uh, obviously very little terrestrial network coverage um, uh, out at sea. Um, and and I, th I think we're gonna see a continued expansion of the types of situation that demand connectivity, whether that is for critical communications for engineers, whether it's the um, you know, control, the SCADA uh, systems for um, operating the assets, or whether it's sort of associated uh, IoT and monitoring systems, could be uh, security cameras to um, perhaps uh, sensors for uh, measuring air and water quality, um, as well as um, in some cases the, the retail part of the industry um, you know, the uh, metering for residential uh, customers for electricity and gas, um, or um, the retail side of the uh, energy po uh, petroleum industry, which I'm not really going to touch on today. All of these have some, frankly, larger challenges than just choosing which wireless network is appropriate. Um, the timing of this uh, this session is very is very apt, uh, given what's going on in Glasgow uh, this week and next week. Uh, with COP26, and it's pretty clear that um, there are going to be massive shifts um, down to decarbonisation of um, not just the energy sector, but pretty much every area of the economy, from food to cement as well. And that will have knock-on effects. Um, for example, uh, if we move to a hydrogen economy, or if we move to 
um, uh, more decentralization or creating synthetic fuels for um, the jets of the future, they will need energy to do some of those uh, new tasks or additional incremental uh, localized energy resources as well. Obviously seeing a huge amount of emphasis on, on um, new classes of energy generation, whether that's solar or tidal and um, perhaps modular nuclear. Um, cyber security is absolutely a uh, fundamental concern across this whole sector. We've, there have been a couple of uh, well publicized incidents, whether that's with ransomware or um, outright state actors hacking. Um, that is clearly a concern and will we'll carry on, as, especially as we get to be more data dependent and uh, automated um, with new um, with new mechanisms which have perhaps less opportunity for you know, manual or mechanical fallback. And there will certainly be new vul vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. We are seeing already uh, uh, the desire for having not just resilient but redundant uh, communication systems uh, in some cases. Um, I mentioned uh, data and AI, uh, and that has multiple levels um, of fit with um, this sector. And you know, whilst I would say that perhaps the utilities industry has been relatively slow in terms of adoption of cloud technologies, I think we can expect some aspects of cloud to become a lot more important, whether that's creating uh, so-called digital twins of infrastructure and assets um, to optimize performance and do predictive maintenance. Um, or whether it's more around things like demand management and demand forecasting for um, you know, power and, and gas and water, um, but also to look at ways of optimizing um, you know, asset performance um, given uh, constraints on, on financials uh, going forward. Um, electrification um, obviously has a huge impact in terms of how and where electricity um, will be consumed, but also interestingly, um, there's discussions about whether or not you could use a car as a battery, as a power store overnight. So, you know, can you do this part of the decentralized power and electricity storage grid of the future? And there's a huge amount of connectivity requirements associated with um, things like EV charging, um, you know, where obviously we're going to see a lot more EV chargers at what were historically gas stations or rest areas on public highways, um, but also um, municipalities are looking at this. So, you know, I live in the centre of London and few people have uh, garages or off-street parking. And so there's a huge requirement for public, oh, public, either public owned or in public spaces to have charging capabilities, uh, which will require communications for uh, both the operation, uh, but also the payment models um, and other commercial aspects as well. And lastly, there's, um, the impact of climate change on the industry as well as from the industry. Um, and we've seen uh, increase in wildfire incidents in some parts of the world which have the potential to uh, destroy infrastructure uh, and also um, that brings some interesting tensions in terms of um, reliance on, on connectivity, particularly if you have public um, mobile services which may firstly be damaged in fires, but also whether it's possible to give prioritization not just to public safety agencies, but also utilities if necessary as well. And so I think that's one of the major shifts. We've also seen um, in some cases flooding, uh, hurricanes. We can expect more forms of extreme weather, which obviously will have an impact in terms of the operations of um, uh, utility grids or uh, oil and gas facilities or others um, and will require if anything redoubled communications um, networking capabilities to both spot incidents uh, early perhaps with uh, drones or sensors uh, spotting fl uh, flames or smoke um, but also in terms of um, isolating parts of um, the infrastructure if necessary and then recovery uh, after faults or after after damage. Um, one of the things, I mean, I, so I come from a wireless background, and when I look at the utilities, I'm, I, I'm amazed by the, the new set of acronyms um, that uh, occur when I look at the IT and uh, OT, operational technology um, uh, systems that apply in different uh, parts of the utility and energy sector. And uh, most of the people I imagine on the call are probably familiar with these, um, but there's a whole set of things around, whether it's mission critical push to talk, where you perhaps have um, uh, 4G or 5G in future, uh, cellular supplementing or replacing older 
uh, two-way radios, truck radios of like P25 and, and Tetra. Um, distributed energy resources, which is the um, umbrella term for connecting you know, um, uh, lots more locations which have both generation and storage capabilities for electricity. So rather than a few large power plants, um, solar cells are typically dispersed across private and public realms. Um, we may have storage and battery units, but also you have the, um, the growing requirement to feed electricity back into the grid. And so there's a bi-directional aspect of power that comes from uh, a lot of the new uh, renewable resources, as well as variability according to the weather um, or to uh, other um, uh, you know, condi uh, atmospheric conditions, especially for wind as well as solar. What that will mean is a requirement for more data in more places and more accurate control and much less predictability um, of uh, where energy is going to be generated, where it's going to be consumed, and also where it's and where and how it's going to be stored and then delivered from storage. And that's both uh, temporary storage for perhaps overnight use or um, during a particular busy period. We also have to think more long term as to what happens in, say, colder climates during the winter when you have very little uh, sun in some parts of the world for months on end. Um, where does electricity come from? Do you have to uh, transmit it long distances from uh, sunnier parts of the planet? Um, or do you have to try to work out ways to store mass amounts of, of energy in a convenient form locally? Fault location, isolation, and service, rest service restoration, that's not new, but we're, again, we're going to be seeing that evolve um, so that you know, customer service, as well as uh, as well as the um, the sustainability, there's obviously uh, like all industries a, a huge uh, effort around uh, improving uh, customer um, the customer experience, whether that's recovery after a fault, um, or whether it's the safety of people who are um, uh, you know, going and fixing um, uh, problems when they occur. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll pick out another couple of these to to, to look at now. Um, I think sensing technology is one that applies across all of the subsectors, whether that's electricity, water, gas, um, petroleum, or, you know, and, and, and LNG. There's a huge amount of both regulatory and um, uh, corporate uh, responsibility, ESG, um, uh, demand for um, tracking, whether it's pollution in air or water, uh, it could be noise or vibration, um, and it could also be um, you know, watching the environment for uh, external changes that could impact the performance of um, utility resources and assets. I think there's going to be there's a, a, a huge interest in the um, resilience of the grid, um, whether that is in managing um, uh, short circuits, whether it's in dealing with uh, cybersecurity um, risks um, to uh, you know, national infrastructure. Um, I've spoken to some organizations that are now looking at having um, completely air-gapped um, fiber networks and wireless networks um, as, a, as a backup uh, for certain parts of uh, the, the, the high, high voltage grid, for example. Advanced metering. Um, to some extent, metering is a little bit outside of the scope of, of private networks, but actually um, in some metropolitan uh, contexts, you may well find that um, uh, that sits outside of the traditional public uh, wireless networks and becomes a private or semi-private or municipal uh, option as well. And I'll talk a bit more about the, the different options for private 4G and 5G in a moment. One last comment, the, the, the thing at the bottom, is, as well as these traditional um, asset um, use cases or very asset driven use cases, we also have a set of associated systems, devices um, and connected objects um, that relate to the utility industry. So you know, vehicles, um, whether they're field service vehicles or um, uh, going out to customers, um, whether they're construction and so on. Increasing use of drones, robots, uh, security cameras uh, with video analytics uh, in particular, and, and also um, and, and hi highlighted in the, the recent news around the metaverse, there's an awful lot of emphasis of, on AR and VR. And I have to say, I'm a little bit skeptical of that in some contexts, but there's certainly a set of reasons uh, in field for field engineers in particular to have um, 
visual systems that allow them to keep their hands free. So I think we'll see more uh, augmented reality glasses, visors, and so on, which have very high connectivity to models. And I'm sure there's hundreds of others that specific people on the call will have had. So again, feel free to drop in a question about things as well as we go through. The other side to this is the, the geographic scope for connectivity. Um, and I, I think this is important when we consider um, the role of private 4G and 5G networks. And I see this in many sectors. In some cases, we will get networks deployed at a micro scale, like an individual, not even a whole building, but just one particular application or a subsystem inside a plant. I've talked to someone who um, puts private wireless networks inside um, uh, the um, vessels, pressure vessels, in uh, oil and chemical refineries um, so that they can clean them once a year and be out and finished in a day. And that's a temporary, very localized um, deployment. And others you will find mid-sized deployments, one, one kilometer, three kilometers, which could be a, um, a generation plant, it could be a LNG terminal, it could be a water treatment center, um, where they have significant requirements on premise for connecting um, the local SCADA systems or um, two-way radios or security cameras. Quite often you will see networks starting with you know, one or two use cases and then onboarding others uh, over time. The regional or the mid-size area, it could be a 10 kilometer radius for an oil field. It could be an offshore wind farm, again, you know, maybe 10, five, five, 10 kilometer radius, large solar facilities, or it could also be um, a smart city scenario where the city perhaps has a, a municipal a utility company. They're very interested in uh, also um, big pitch uh, for cities to consider their overall carbon footprint. Uh, and so they may well be doing sensing, they could be doing smart meeting, metering, demand management. But I would also find there the utilities might overlap with um, you know, lighting, for example, in the city to, to deal with overall consumption. But that would be maybe a, yeah, out of 10, 20, 50 kilometer radius uh, type scenario. Then I've mentioned already the sort of national level, whether that's the grid, whether it's pipelines, whether it's uh, perhaps uh, automotive fleets. This is perhaps one of those areas where the public and private networks intersect. Um, and whilst the IoT use cases may have um, a dedicated private spectrum, and I'll talk about spectrum uh, in a few minutes, um, it may well be that for vehicles, there is more reliance on the public network providers maybe offering a, um, a, a subset of a network or a network slice. Um, I think that's something that's interesting. And certainly EV charging uh, also has to, to, to operate at uh, typically national scale as well. And the last one is a little bit out of scope here, but all of these are part of global supply chains. Um, where there may be companies that have uh, assets overseas, particularly I'm thinking the oil and gas industry, you've got um, perhaps requirements for connectivity to uh, tanker ships or um, other forms of supply, um, as well as uh, considering the, the global implications for monitoring of certain types of energy resources. So this is talking a little bit more about the technologies and uh, this is a slide i've used in, in variations over the years and uh, uh, the thing is i actually have to apologize for it being too simple rather than too complex when you start talking about wireless technologies there are at least six arguably 10 dimensions at which you can describe um, wireless networks there's the um, coverage um, how broad is it? What type is it? Do we need to think about 3D coverage for drones as well as um, area coverage? Um, does it have to work indoors, on campuses, underground sometimes? Um, important, well, obviously the, the importance axis is, is, is fundamental to the utility and oil sectors, um, where a lot of uh, sectors that I look at, it could be office buildings, it could be sports venues. There's a lot of sort of business critical use cases. But to be honest, in the, these sectors, utility in particular, it's critical national infrastructure. Um, and there's a lot of also safety critical um, aspects as well, whether it's because of voltages, whether it's because of explosive gases, um, often come with their own regulatory uh, overhead as well. Ranges I, I talked about already. Um, and, and clearly, you know, we're talking typically a, a, a mid-size and wide area for most of um, wireless connectivity uh, in this area. Spectrum models. Now, in the past, um, 
wireless spectrum, particularly for cellular or Wi-Fi networks, was either national exclusive licenses for carriers, um, or it was unlicensed, for example, use of Wi-Fi uh, in buildings. The utility and in, in other uh, infrastructure sectors have had a lot of point-to-point -point links as well. So they're licensed on a, a relatively light basis between uh, specific locations. Uh, and I think that's probably a differentiator compared to some of the other sectors that I've discussed. So it's not really just a binary, you know, is it cellular, is it Wi-Fi? But obviously the cellular industry is used you know, two-way radio of various types. It's used microwave links as well as a lot of fiber. Um, so that's uh, another dimension, if you like. But what is happening now on the spectrum side in many countries around the world, um, there is the ability to get localized spectrum um, to build private networks for campuses or, or, or individual sites, or there's more sometimes dedicated spectrum being allocated to um, utility sectors or other verticals. Um, there's a big pitch in Europe at the moment around 450 megahertz um, for um, utilities and, and other infrastructure services. Um, in France, there's um, a particular band aimed at large industries to replace their two-way radius, 2.6 gigahertz. There's also um, more interest in dynamic spectrum models. And so uh, there's probably a lot of people on the call from uh, the US where you've had the CBRS band. And CBRS, I'm not going to go into it in a lot of depth, but is um, this band between 3.55 and 3.7 gigahertz that is available on a, um, well, initially on a county size level, but there may be a secondary marketplace later. And there's both um, a protected section of that, which is semi exclusive licenses. Um, or there's uh, what's called general access, which is more open to anyone requesting um, a spectrum for connectivity in a particular location at a particular time. It's worth saying that for CBRS, there is actually um, a top level incumbent, which in most cases is the, the military, uh, which gets the preemption rights. Although obviously in, in large parts of the country, you know, if, if you're inland, you don't have to worry about aircraft carriers too much. Um, and then obviously there's bandwidth and latency and latency is particularly important in some of the use cases of utilities such as the teleprotection um, and whether that latency is people talk about milliseconds tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds um, a lot of uh, use cases that we're thinking about here may well be 10 milliseconds or below but more importantly they need to be deterministic and predictable latency so anyway the, the point being here is there's no one single wireless technology or solution um, there's more coming along all the time a lot of interest around uh, low earth orbit satellites recently for example as well um so why would companies want private networks uh, and i've highlighted in red the ones which i think are particularly relevant to to this in uh, this industry uh, and I, I say this sort of if like the five c's most obvious one is coverage um public network and public cellular only has limited coverage especially for 5g um and even for 4g in a lot of places there's just either thin coverage or unreliable coverage or, or expensive coverage um, and particularly in buildings perhaps less relevant for some of the sectors here um, but there's certainly you know, a, an em emphasis to have uh, improvement of coverage which is one of the drivers for private networks uh, particularly in rural areas uh, particularly in industrial zones given that, that mobile carriers tend to deploy first um, in places with lots of people um, and in fact uh, often their license conditions uh, around spectrum are key to population density and population coverage um, and obviously there's a, a lot of the regions that uh, will have utility assets where you know, at least locally um, the population is very small um, you know in an industrial zone control is really critical control is ownership of the network and the ability to um, write your own service level agreements um, there's very few commercial strong SLAs from public networks today. That might change in future with 5G and network slicing, but even then what those SLAs will offer, what, what guarantees they provide and how they're backed up is a, a, a huge issue. I remember being at an event a while back where um, uh, one of the utility speakers responding to a, a telecoms person was saying, well, first off, um, your network depends on our electricity. So if we go down, you go down, and then we can't None of us can get back up afterwards unless you've got diesel backup everywhere. And the other thing was talking about quality of service and uh, making the point that um, you know, reliability and uptime isn't just about um, fixing a failure in a few hours. Uh, it may involve having um, 
a helicopter on hot standby to fly people out to a remote location if necessary. For 5G, there's a bunch of other things that come in. And one is that um, specific industries have particular requirements for uplink and downlink, which may not match the um, general mass market mobile network. And so having private spectrum and private networks allows customized builds of network um, to, that can accommodate particular applications, either in terms of throughput, say lots of uplink if you've got lots of video cameras, um, it could be lots of downlink um, for, um, it could be if you're using AR and VR, for example, uh, or it could be deterministic latency and, and a bunch of other characteristics, but owning the network is important on that scenario. Life cycle management is, is also critical. And um, the cellular industry tends to think in, silo, in cycles of 10 years, whereas often utilities and other asset heavy sectors think in terms of 20 years, even 30 years. You don't want to be deploying a network um, and then being told that the spectrum is going to be refarmed for 7G in 2040, perhaps. Um, I'm joking in part, but it's actually uh, a, a significant consideration and also relates to how the network gets financed as well. Um, cloud is a bit less important, I would say, in the sectors here, but it's becoming more so. Um, and a lot of private cellular networks are heavily integrated with um, cloud infrastructure. And there's some interesting overlaps in the vendor space between companies that are offering, say, private uh, 4G and 5G core networks either delivered from the cloud or are themselves the cloud providers. Uh, I was talking, to, uh, I was on a call yesterday with um, a project that Facebook is running called Magma, uh, which is an open source um, uh, cloud core network for 4G and 5G. I, I don't think that an open source uh, Facebook uh, core is necessarily um, what we're gonna have in our critical infrastructure, but it's nonetheless interesting. Um, I, I think that digital twins, um, are perhaps where some of the aspects of cloud come in, being able to replicate with sensor data and other inputs um, the, the the physical assets in the virtual world um, to optimize for performance, uh, model for um, uh, maintenance issues and so on. Cost is fairly self-explanatory, whether that's around the legacy of uh, LMR or whether it's avoiding uh, carrier uh, fees per gigabyte or per subscriber or per user. Um, and it's also for IoT connectivity, looking at total cost of ownership. One last one, uh, compensation. I know that some utility companies actually are uh, morphing into um, public service providers and actually using private networks um, to deliver connectivity to other third parties, whether that's other utilities or uh, you know, perhaps uh, infrastructure services, highway and, and road agencies, for instance. Um, or in some cases may even be able to offer community level fixed wireless access uh, or other services depending on you know, local competition and, and regulatory uh, issues. So there's a lot of reasons why companies, if they can get private network and they've got the skills, um, that they might want to, uh, want to um, take that approach. Um, why is this happening now? And I'd say there's, there's three things. Um, that are going on. First off is the local availability of spectrum. Um, CBRS in the US, 3.7 gigahertz in Germany, a number of bands here in the UK and a number of other countries are looking at having spectrum either dedicated to particular industry verticals or which is more generally accessible on a, um, a small area basis based on a relatively lightweight licensing regime. Um, Technology is moving on, small cells, uh, cloud-based core networks, uh, Open RAN is potentially going to democratize that uh, further in future, although perhaps less applicable to this industry. Maybe we can talk about it uh, through the questions. Uh, and also 4G to 5G transition. And the, the transition to 5G brings in, not right now because it's still early and expensive, and there's not many devices around, but in the medium term, um, 5G has additional capabilities that may be appealing to um, utility and energy sectors, such as you know, definable latencies, um, enterprise grade, you know, uh, quality of service. You know, into, when I say enterprise grade, it's more manageable from what looks like an enterprise uh, tool set. Um, and, and sometimes these well, the private networks will be owned by carriers and if you like leased to enterprises and other times they'll be owned outright. And, and I see a, a sort of a lot of interesting over, overlaps with this and there's a few other 
um, hot, hot topics and buzzwords like neutral host that often get uh, thrown around as well. Uh, and, and also there's a political angle to all of this, both in terms of the, um, the in protecting uh, public infrastructure. Um, there's um, a lot of places around the world, uh, huge infrastructure spending that's uh, likely to come through um, as a result of uh, post-pandemic uh, recovery funds, um, which I suspect is gonna get translated into, in part, new forms of connectivity. And then obviously I mentioned before the, the climate change aspects where we'll see both new energy types, but also new physical locations requiring control. And I think that that's going to be a, a real motivator for private cellular networks. If you're building a new offshore wind farm or a solar farm in the, in the desert, there's probably no public cellular coverage and you probably don't want to use legacy wireless. So I think we're going to see a lot more use of uh, custom cellular networks. So. Sorry, I missed a slide there. Um, I'm not going to go through every country. I uh, mentioned the US already, but there's a lot of movement around the world on localized um, spectrum. Um, and the good, the good news is it's happening in lots of countries. The bad news is it's different everywhere. Um, and there's a lot of what's going on with mid-band spectrum. So CBRS is 3.5, Germany's 3.7, uh, UK's got 3.8, 4.2, Japan's got some different ones, Taiwan have got some different ones again. Um, a few places have got millimeter wave, which I don't think is as relevant for this sector. But actually what's more interesting is um, various sub gigahertz bands um, that are being made available not in huge quantities, obviously, but enough for IoT, perhaps for um, uh, critical commu uh, voice communications. Um, and so in the US, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on 900 megahertz, um, particularly from a company called Antarix, which is then working with um, local uh, providers in uh, a number of places. Um, in Norway, there's a specific spectrum for offshore in the North Sea. Um, as I mentioned before, a number of countries around Europe are looking at 450 megahertz. So I think that the, the low and mid band options are, are likely to provoke a lot of innovation. In the long term, I would imagine that most countries eventually will have some mix of um, private addressable spectrum in low band, mid band and high band. But I think it's going to take quite a long time to get there and there's going to be a lack of harmonization. I think what I would say is that we're definitely seeing the private networks move up the regulatory and political agendas um, uh, and I think that in some markets um, the uh, public network carriers are su being surprised at how much pent up the demand there is from what the telecoms industry call verticals but the rest of us just think of as the rest of rest of, of the end of the 97 percent of the rest of the industry uh, whether that's the utilities and oil and gas or whether it's sports and entertainment, hospitality or retail or anything else. And I think that, the, that it's the fact that these demands cut across so many um, different industries um, that are, are sort of helping drive the innovation around the, um, the small cells and the softwareization and the control, and also really importantly, the skill sets. And I think that the, perhaps it, there's one gap at the moment is that there's probably insufficient numbers of trained people who understand um, private cellular in an enterprise context and uh, yeah, frankly if anyone's on the, on the call and has a training company I think you're you're definitely in the sweet spot for a lot of this. So this is becoming a more main, mainstream and I, I think we shouldn't underestimate how many networks now clearly utility industry is likely to only have single digit numbers in most countries. I know the US is unusual when there's like 3000 regional providers, but a lot of countries have national uh, electric or water or um, gas com uh, companies or state level. Um, but I think that we're gonna see a, um, a huge emphasis at the top end of the spectrum, um, a size spectrum for um, utility and energy. I mentioned this, this sort of mid, large mid size, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, interest in um, you know, everything from uh, wind farms to nuclear power stations to uh, reservoirs, uh, water treatment centers and so on. And then as you move down towards the smaller networks, um, substations, for example, for electrical uh, distribution at a regional level. Um, and actually, there's going to be some very small networks as well. So uh, interestingly, 
um, uh, at least one company I know does uh, private networks on uh, ships that are servicing uh, offshore oil and wind. Um, and it's for the crew, the crew and also potentially containers and asset management on board the ship, as well as communication uh, back to shore. So again, we have to think about the, the scale of, of how many networks there are, as well as how large they are. Um, a couple of slides on the role of mobile operators and carriers. Um, if you go back about three years, there was a big assumption in the mobile industry that um, 5G was going to be driven by enterprise and B2B. Um, and unfortunately, it is, but for a lot of carriers are finding out that actually uh, it's being driven more by those companies wanting to deploy their own network rather than buy commercial services from carriers. Now, there's a, there's a big variation here, depends on the application and use case. Clearly, for telematics, for vehicles and field workers, public networks are more likely to be adopted. Um, but certainly on site, on premise, and for critical infrastructure, um, the requirements that I detailed earlier on are leading a lot of uh, utility and energy companies to explore whether they can obtain their own networks, either on their own spectrum or perhaps leasing spectrum from a carrier. Um, going forward, you know, as we get to later versions of 5G, we might see this uh, um, quasi-magical technology called network slicing allow um, custom uh, virtualized networks on the public infrastructure with particular characteristics of quality of service or latency or whatever. Uh, we're not there yet, and um, I'll, I'll show you in a minute why the, the, the phasing of 5G is, uh, uh, is still a, an issue there. So it's also worth noting that there's a, a complex relationship of utilities and public and private mobile networks. Um, you know, at one level, utility companies are deploying their own uh, private uh, 4G and 5G networks, and they are customers of carriers' enterprise mobile offerings. Yeah, I mentioned telematics or just good old smartphones and uh, voice calls. Um, but on the other side, actually utility companies also have a bit of a symbiotic relationship with the telecoms industry because they're some of the leading asset owners um, for uh, siting of a cellular infrastructure. Water towers, for example, is a classic case. Um, but also I know that there's others on the electricity uh, side where they're looking at reusing uh, poles um, for example, for small cells as well as uh, electricity wires. So I think that then fiber, things like fiber backhaul is an interesting um, uh, you know, sector in the middle of this as well as to who owns the fiber, who's a tenant on it. So I think we're going to see this, this sort of convergence and some perhaps some interesting commercial relationships um, when uh, the, the bilateral uh, aspects of this are, are considered more fully. A couple of examples of real world uh, private LTE and 5G, uh, some in North America, some in Europe. Um, yeah, and I think this, this is probably when I talk at, at uh, more broad uh, private um, cellular conferences, I usually hold up the utilities sector as top of the list for what is actually happening today on production networks. And there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, the first one I would say is the, the networks are larger. Um, and so they look like mini telco networks, which means that the vendors are able to maintain roughly comparable processes, roughly comparable pricing. Um, yeah, it's essentially, it's, it's, a, it's a country sized or a city or region sized network, which is a lot in some ways easier than a building sized one, which will do, grow over time. Um, the other thing is they're outdoors predominantly which is a significantly different, a significant, um, a significantly different to the sort of factory type uh, automation and warehouse scenarios, which are being trialed now, but there's not an awful lot of indoor private cellular yet, although I'm expecting that to drive huge amount of demand in warehousing and logistics and manufacturing going forward. Um, Quick one on 5G, uh, and it's easy to get distracted from 5G without realizing that actually the majority of private cellular that's being played today, deployed today, is, is actually private 4G. Uh, CBRS is almost entirely uh, 4G networks. There's a couple of early examples of 5G small cells um, that are in the labs, but as far as I know, none have been certified today. And uh, even in UK, Germany, other parts of the world, although there's some interesting trials going on with private 5G, the actual action and commercial deployments are with 4G, to, um, at least for the next couple of years. And I suspect perhaps beyond that as well. Um, one of the main reasons for that is if you're not um, regularly watching what's going on in cellular, 5G is actually not one monolithic technology. It's a series of phases 
different technology releases. What we have today and what we call 5G, to be honest, is 4G++. Um, we're just getting to the start of phase two with 5G, where the, the key component is the new core network. Um, historically, with, with the 5G we've used for the last couple of years, you've used the old 4G network core, which obviously isn't much use for an enterprise if you haven't got an old 4G core. Carriers can deploy it, but it's harder for, for private enterprises unless they want to deploy old equipment just to run the radio. That changes now. It is possible to go and buy a 5G core network, what called standalone mode. And that will evolve uh, further over time with subsequent uh, releases of the 3GPP technology to adopt slicing, ultra level, low latency. But to be honest, they're still a while off. And I think what we're happening is, um, is We'll start with the simpler use cases, the two-way radio, the um, sensors, the video cameras and the like, and all of the sort of really fancy promised, you know, millisecond low latency stuff, I'd say come back in two to three to four years for that. A busy slide, I'm not going to go through all of this. Essentially, again, the world is going to be heterogeneous. Um, you're going to have public 4G and 5G, private 4G and 5G. Wi-Fi is probably less relevant to this sector, except for you know, in even, I suppose, the utility companies in your in your offices um, and perhaps warehouses, you'll be using Wi-Fi. You're not going to have too many cellular equipped uh, PCs or uh, display TVs and screen, video screens. Um, so the, the you know, Wi-Fi is going to be hugely important in any indoor context. Um, <clears throat> And there's still going to be a lot of other technologies. You know, satellite is becoming uh, more interesting at the moment, uh, given the investment in Leo constellations. Um, and there's also obviously a lot of fiber as well as fixed wireless links that's going to be critical for uh, a time to come in, in a lot of areas. I, I definitely think that the, the sweet spot for private 4G and 5G is anything that moves, whether that's a human or a vehicle um, or a robot in some situations, um, or where there is a requirement for um, you know, very, very high reliability. Um, that's especially for private uh, cellular, um, where um, it's a big part of critical infrastructure and there's likely to be both resiliency and redundancy needs. So a last slide, um, and I'll open up for Q&A. Uh, feel free to put questions into the um, the chat box if you want, on the question the Q&A box. I don't think we've got anything at the moment. Um, I might be one or two, it doesn't come up very well on my screen. Um, we have a few here, Dean, actually. I can... Ah, okay, I might I'll call on you to read them out in a second. Just just to say that that all of this, you know, if, if I put my futurist hat on for a, for a second and, and thinking, well, what, what happens on a 10-year view? Um, well, the first off is um, we don't just end with 5G. There's already discussions about 6G. There's Open RAN, Wi-Fi 7. So on the wireless side, there's an awful lot that's going to come in even beyond the chart of 5G phases I just showed you. Um, the other thing I would say is that on the technology, on, on the utility and energy slide, um, we obviously we're going to carry on further down the, um, the solar and wind route. Um, potentially, we've got modular nuclear resources. Um, hydrogen is likely to need a whole new set of infrastructure um, to be built. And then that's a picture of a carbon capture station in um, in Iceland. Um, and so I think that we'll see what comes out of Glasgow over the next two weeks. Um, but I think that, that, that to both taking on board the transformation of the industry and decarbonisation, there's going to be a lot of new physical sites and large scale physical infrastructure that will also need connectivity, um, um, you know, which I think will play right into the, um, the, the capabilities of private cellular as well as public networks. So with that, um, I will wrap up. And uh, my contact details there, I'm Disruptive Dean on Twitter, is my LinkedIn, I have a, a technology newsletter that I write occasionally, um, and uh, otherwise fire away with uh, questions and answers. Um, Tony, for some reason, I can't actually see them uh, on my uh, GoToWebinar dashboard, so if you could maybe read anything out, I, I can address yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Dean. Um, so one of the questions here is, what is your view of opportunities in private wireless for multi-dwelling complex and real estate? Do you think landlords can rent access to their in-building wireless networks? Um, I funny enough, I did a project on that. It's a bit outside of utilities, but um, I think I think it's, you, you'll see it first private wireless in that sector for the building owners themselves to run, you know, maybe for their initially for their staff. 
um, perhaps for if they've got commercial tenants. So a lot of mixed property um, scenarios, you've also got retailers or perhaps you use it for security cameras and things. I'm not sure if uh, multi-dwelling for multi-dwelling units, whether yeah, if I'm living in an apartment block, do I want to have a SIM card from my property company rather than a carrier? I'm not sure I do. Yeah, maybe, yeah, I, I, frankly, I, I'll probably just use Wi-Fi when I'm there. Maybe it'd be nice to have local cellular when I'm you know, out in the gardens or on the rooftop bar or something. But I think there's some, there's some possibilities there. Um, but I think that it's going to be a bit of a challenge. I think it's more interesting for mixed offices, maybe, where you've got it's more of a commercial uh, B2B proposition rather than you know students or um, uh, home homeowners. Okay, great. Thanks. Makes sense. Um, one question here: Have you seen any wins for Open RAN in private networks so far? Um, as you know. Um, there's a couple that are being t talked about, and there's a bit of an overlap with uh, between Open RAN and some traditional in-building systems. Uh, I know there's a couple of vendors that are sort of developing hybrids at the moment. Um, I would say not so much. Um, I think that um, a lot of the uh, the current small cells are um, if you like integrated single unit small cells um, for that get used in private networks and for particularly for utilities and large scale networks I think there's a, a, a significant level of conservatism so I'm tending to see the sort of the normal big name vendors um, being used um, for say utility grids now as open RAM matures over the next couple of years I think that's probably going to shift a bit but I, I think we'll first see open RAN used in less critical scenarios such as you know maybe rural coverage replacement of um uh, rip and replace in places which are, are removing chinese vendors this sort of thing mm -hmm. okay um here's a question the good old wi-fi versus 5g question so do you think wi-fi 6 or wi-fi 60 is going to be a big competitor for 5g um I think in some situations, yes. Um, yeah, and I think that what, you know, but not really utilities related. Yeah, you know, they're, they're again, they're they're, far, they're they'll be great for offices and for residential settings, hotels, multi-dwelling units, for example. Um, but you can't, you you're not, are you use Wi-Fi at an electricity substation? No, I don't think you are. Um, yeah, there's going to be certain locations if there's an office that's attached to the power station. Then yes, you'll put it inside in in building. But for actually on the the industrial site, um, there might be some use cases. It could be to connect security cameras. It's probably not bad. Um, but I think that, that there's uh, an in big indoor, outdoor, and critical non-critical divide there. Yeah, makes sense. Um, here's one. Uh, what business models do you foresee will get more traction within the private wireless realm? I don't think a traditional subscriber approach makes any sense and innovation is due within the monetization side of these deployments. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of that depends on whether it's um, who's running. And I think the, the interesting thing for me is that the that, that private cellular, it can be run by a traditional carrier um, as a whether it's a network slice or just a custom build. And I, I'm seeing often the systems integration unit of a carrier has a fair amount of autonomy. And I think that they they will act and, and they will create you know, essentially a private network which could be turnkey, it could be a managed service, they could have SLAs. Um, and so I don't think it would necessarily be running from their main public network, but it could be a local privately constructed project. And they've got a lot more flexibility and autonomy, usually the, the enterprise business units. And then I think you've got the, the ones which are, 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 are run in-house. Um, clearly that's, that's run as in-house asset there's if you like there's not a, a a billing component unless they do internal charging to departments i think there's gonna be some interesting perhaps shared models where you've perhaps maybe got one an electricity and a water utility in the same region that are sharing some assets um whether there's there's actually going to be cash flow between them or whether it's just they set up a holding company i think it's going to depend on the you know, things like regulatory um and what they're allowed to do um, so I think that's an interesting one. And the last one is there's going to be a whole host, already are a whole, whole host of specialised um, 
network operators catering to these verticals um, and whether that's for there's a couple I know that work in the oil industry for offshore um, there's um, a couple that do um, critical communications for onshore communications for you know, um, you know uh, utility companies and and whether it's subscriber or user whether it is you know particularly if, it's, if the main use is for push to talk and low rate data push to talk doesn't make sense to charge per second or minute but you might still have um per connected endpoint um you know as, as a, a a quantum of of charging okay great um, and that question actually takes us to the top of the hour, so we will stop here. A big thanks to you, Dean, for joining us on the webinar today, and a, a big thanks to you, to everyone who joined us today. We will send out a recording to those that are interested. Um, so thanks very much. Thank you, and thanks, Kelly. Bye-bye. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much.